road and you can't even drive? I can. Are you stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. A bit grey today, isn't it? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Deepest Law. And uh, this is the very first show, the very first show, coming to you live from AA Lodge. Um, yes, I am sitting in the lodge. I slept in the lodge last night. I had a very long sleep. I slept for 13 hours. You have 13 hours in which to solve the labyrinth before your baby brother becomes one of us forever. Such a pity. Um, yes, uh, there, there is a brand new schedule, a brand new schedule, ladies and gentlemen. So let me drill it into your minds, okay? Monday afternoon, 3 p.m., Deepest Law. Tuesday, 9 p.m., Unpopular Opinions hasn't changed. Wednesday, 9 p.m., Cigar Stream. That is the schedule for the week. And then what I will do is I'll line up my videos for the week to come out, you know, over over the weekend or whatever. Okay? So you'll have three, three, a bank of three days. Then you've got the rest of the week to catch up on those, on those shows and also to catch any videos I decide to make. All right? So um that's it somebody's saying 3 p.m my ass let me just tell you something sunshine okay let me just tell you something piero phd what's your phd in son what's your phd in how long did you study for come on out with it <laughs> um so uh, <laughs> um but uh yeah you're right i was a little bit late today um i happen to uh i happen to have to go like foraging for berries i had no I, I didn't realize I had no coffee here. I had no tea here. Um, I, so I needed to go and get coffee and tea. So I, uh, first of all, I got, I got lost and ended up in a village. Um, I had to reverse about half a mile uh, because there was this tractor coming the other way. So, you know, again, again, a bit, getting a little bit used to some of the country rural life here. Um, so I got, I got lost by going the wrong way. And then um, I had to like sat nav it all the way back to the lodge, and then start out again, uh, looking for looking to buy some coffee. And I eld I ended up at an Aldi. Oh my god! If you've ever seen an Aldi, ladies and gentlemen, um, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I uh, <sighs> I, I sent out a tweet about my experiences. I said I'm in Aldi. There are giant, there are giant troughs haphazardly stacked with matter down the middle of the aisle, as if the management have decided proper shelving is too good for you people. Honestly, I there's something misanthropic about Aldi. All of the kind of people scuttling, like I don't know, they're just they're treated like pigs and then they behave like pigs i find it really interesting so that's probably the last time i'm going to be visiting an aldi i, I need to locate uh, a higher a higher caliber of store one that does not treat people uh, with such disdain uh, although i admire their honesty I, I admire them telling the cattle you are little more than pigs you know you are little more than uh, creatures to be to be treated in this manner um, I've never seen anything like it. There are these, like, they don't have proper shelves. It's just, like, crates stacked with stuff. And it's just, like, uh, here's some coffee, Peppa Pig toy, bloody, here are some books, uh, here's some cleaning product. And there's just no rhyme or reason to it. It's just, like, stuff. Just, uh, and they don't even like um in some of them they're all just like jumbled up so you have to kind of go rubbaging rubbaging through it looking for you know random things it's um it really is something uh bizarre i just don't get it uh so um people are saying that's why it's cheap <laughs> indeed offer you're going to like this stream son 
uh, because it's all about <laughs> this stream is all about uh, um, the chosen people, as it were, um, because, well, I've been listening to a chap called Thomas Biden Reese, who, um, he had a couple of run-ins with him. He's made a couple of videos where he tried to have a go at me, and then he, he, had a, he made a video having a go at uh, Poe the person who he hates, um, and then uh, various other things. Um, and uh, but, but anyway, he he does these streams where he he kind of assesses and looks at dozens of people. He did one on nationalists, uh, you know, talking about uh, people in the nationalist scene. He did one on like YouTubers where he looked at uh, many different people. Um, he looked at like the fake right where he uh, he had a lengthy critique of the British show and D and various other people. Um, and um yeah he hates ed dutton um but there's something about thomas biden reese that i kind of like i kind of dig his i don't know i feel like i understand him instinctually um now there are some odd there are some odd elements of thomas biden reese like his compulsive lying for example which i'm not uh i'm not sure how to take that he, he's like an he's like an open liar and i i, I don't really i don't really get that um but but anyway, he did a he did a stream recently uh, on spiked uh, with Horus and with Nick Unwash. This is the other weird thing about the Thomas Biden Reese streams. Unwashed is sensible on those streams. Uh, I mean, you will all know Unwashed from my uh, you know women's question stream that I did with him, and for uh, you know simping for various unsavory women. Um, but. Uh, Unwashed seems like perfectly sensible on those streams. Well, anyway, I was listening to this Thomas Biden Reese character. Um, somebody say he's like the type of character I give a wide berth to in real life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> um, but <laughs> there's something of I don't know. There's something about there's something about him that uh, I've been really enjoying these streams that he does. Right. Um, so uh, apparently it's Baden Reese, not Biden. Okay, fair enough. Um, so uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> hold on a minute. <clears throat> um, uh, he was going through like the various people who write for Unwashed, and one of the people was Judy Birchill, who wrote this book called Unchosen. Okay, and the subtitle of the book is "The Memoirs of a Philo Semite." Okay, now I don't know what this book says, but the very idea of it itself intrigues me. Okay, intrigues me. Um, so today we're going to be reading out bits of "Unchosen" by Julie Birchall, and maybe critiquing some of it on the fly. But I'm interested as to how this could even come about. The just the idea of it in itself is fascinating. Um, and we're, we're going to analyze the front cover. We're going to analyze, um, uh, we're going to ask why was this book published? We're going to analyze some of the blurb on the back of the book. Um, it's, it really is. It is something to behold, I, I tell you. Okay. Now, um, also, I'm still doing my fasting. I haven't eaten, friends, since 7 p.m. last night. Um, and my window for eating doesn't open until five. So all I've had is a Nescafe gold to eat today. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's how I'm rolling. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, years, I would stick around for this stream. I think you'd enjoy this one. Uh, <coughs> as, 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 uh, you should offer here, if you're still here, I think anybody interested in this, in this particular issue should stick around because i think it's um whichever side of the aisle you're on it's a fascinating document that this exists okay um uh before i get going here uh first of all thanks a lot to uh d for his eight part andy warhol series he kind of it was almost like a kind of residency that uh that d had on the deepest law uh, from july until november and it's like um, when a poet in residence has like finished their term. Now I'm like, what do I fill the deepest law with now? Um, Pharaoh had 
Um, Pharaoh has. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, Poe, I, I don't have sugar. I forgot to buy sugar in Aldi. So it, this is unsugared coffee, unfortunately. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, yes, it's unfair. It's unfair. But uh, no sugar. No sugar! Did I ever tell you that I had a idea of a series of adverts for Pepsi Max where um, the setup was, you can imagine like a romantic couple in a restaurant, you know, like Poe and Mr. Poe, for example, in a restaurant. Um, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, I don't know, like Mr. Poe goes to order a Pepsi, for example, and um, essentially the setup would be that a kind of genie character or an Indian, it could be an Indian chap. Um, I had in mind the one from Seinfeld who goes, no, 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 no. Uh, could be an Indian chap or it could be a genie. I haven't quite decided, but kind of de definitively ethnically Eastern, like from Asia, they should be, okay. And basically they come from under the table or they rush in and they interrupt the couple and he would just go in in Mr. Poe's face. No sugar! Like that. A bit like the old Tango adverts where the Tango man would, you know, get in somebody's face. No sugar! And then, um, you know, he, Pepsi, the setup is to avoid having the sugar, you have the Pepsi Max, okay? Um and then and then there'd be a series of these adverts. So, like, in the second advert, for example, the couple, let's say it's Poe and Mr. Poe, would be, let's say, on a, um, let's say on one of those, uh, those big wheels, you know, like the Millennium Eye, for example. They'd be on the Millennium Eye, and, um, you know, I don't know, Mr. Poe would say to, to Poe, uh, oh, have you got a, have you got a Pepsi in your bag? And she'd go to get it. And then somehow, as if by magic, this figure whether he's the Indian or the genie or whatever, would emerge even within the bubble of the of the thing. And he'd be like, no sugar. And um th that was the whole that was the whole series of adverts that I had planned. Um so uh yes, uh that was, you know, that was my that was my second great advert series that never got never got made. My my first series was the uh retiring the Big Mac saga that I had. Um but the second, uh, the second one was my no sugar advert, um, yeah. and then I noticed that um, I don't know if uh, Pepsi Max advertisers took notice of my ravings, but uh, as if by magic, a couple of months later, um, Pepsi Max did start running massive billboards in London with just the words "no sugar" on it. It's just like Pepsi Max, no sugar, like that. So, I mean, clearly something was in the ether there. Uh, oh, yeah, I haven't put Entropy Live. Thanks for reminding me, years. I always forget. Now, how is my sound, folks? This is the first time I'm coming from the lodge. Uh, what, what do we think? Sound good? Does it sound good? Any, can you even notice if, if you didn't know? That uh, I was I was in a different place. Would you know I'm not? Um, one thing I don't have is the threat of AAA coming in at any moment. Um, although apparently she has been missing her daddy, so you know I'm gonna have to go home soon. Probably um, probably cigar stream this week will be from home, uh, not from the lodge because uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, away um, at this moment. Especially because I'm the one who typically uh, typically puts uh, AAA to bed. Oh, hold on. Have I got any work done yet? No. Uh, no, I've just I've literally spent most of the day ineffectually driving around looking to buy some coffee and then forgetting to buy sugar. That's that's literally my day so far. So now now, now I'm here. So um, yeah, somebody says I sound lonely. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, th this is this is the story of my life. I um, I continuously look for the the kind of amazing space where I'm totally alone, and then as soon as I get there, I freak out. <laughs> That's basically what happens. <laughs> um, so anyway, 
Um, yes, that's my that's that's literally. Um, yeah, what's the other thing? Um, the other thing I do is that I'm perpetually looking for that amazing rainy day where you get to play all your video games and all the Steam games. But when the rainy day comes, I can't decide what to do. So if I ever get that amazing rainy day where there's nothing to do, do you think I play the Steam games? No. No, I'll, I'll probably look through them and then can't be bothered to play any of them. So, um, so yes, the the panaceas, the panaceas of being truly alone and having the rainy day that never comes. If they ever finally arrive, I, I always freak out and never. Um, I mean, I remember once I was um, there was a. I don't know if you remember a few years ago there were massive floods, and I was living in an area that, that really flooded badly. It was uh, it was February, and. Um, it was flooded so badly that I couldn't get to work. I had to I had to write in and say, look, look, I'm surrounded by water here. I'm not sure what to do. My car was stuck and all, all the rest of it. And um, I finally had it. I finally had the situation where I had the rainy day that never came. I had a I had a bank of literally a week where I was stuck in the I was stuck, and it was. I don't think it was past the second day where I was crawling up the walls. I had cabin fever. I had to get out. I bought plastic bags. I, I put plastic bags on my feet to, to walk through the water. I called work and said, listen, fuck it. I'm going to come in anyway. J just sod it. I'm going to, I'm going to catch the train. Um, I, I've put plastic bags on my feet. I'll catch the train. So um, basically I am, uh, when it comes to my own kind of, uh, my own notions of what I truly want. Uh, I'm profoundly confused or and or fraudulent in my own mind. Because if I ever if I ever get the things I want, um, I can't. You know, I don't really want them. So there we go. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, yes. Uh, sh shall we start our look at? Um, shall I start my look? at um poe are you are you i can't believe poe is already trying to um um pause my pepsi max advert saying it should be a mixed race couple <laughs> no don't make it a mixed race couple <laughs> okay so let me um let me have a look. I'm not rambling, Golandia. Rambling is where you lose the thread of an argument. Rambling is when you don't know what you're saying or you don't know where you're going. I know exactly what I'm where I'm going and what I'm saying. So don't accuse me of rambling. Thank you very much. Next time, Galinda, you can get out. Go go and go and watch some lesser channel if you uh, if you think I'm rambling. I'm not rambling. So uh, anyway, let me uh, let me have a look at. Um, let me have a look at uh, Unchosen by Julie Birchall then. So the first thing I want to do here is I want to analyze the, the front cover of this book because um, this is a book about how Julie Birchall wishes that she had been born Jewish. And um, uh, the quote by Tanya Gold, and I don't know who Tanya Gold is. I will have a look up Tanya Gold. Uh, just to see if she is chosen, so to speak. Um, let's have a look. Tanya Gold is a journalist. She writes for The Guardian, Daily Mail, The Independent, The Telegraph, The Sunday Times, The Evening Standard, The Spectator. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't have a section on her, on her biography, sadly. She is on Twitter, though. Um, so can we... I mean... If I was to guess, looking at Tanya Gold, I would say that Tanya Gold uh, is Jewish. Okay, so that would make sense, I think, for Tanya Gold to be, um, you know, I think it would make sense for the person to write the the blurb on the front of this book to be chosen as opposed to unchosen. Okay, and um, she says. Judy Birchill has the most chronic case of Jew madness on record. Incurable, irrational, uh, irrational, and very funny. I love this book. 
And the book depicts Julie Birchall herself as a clown, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an unhappy clown sitting in the middle of members of, uh, members of this group. Now, how, now, before we even get going here, <laughs> how does this book even come about? Um, I don't really understand. Uh, I don't really understand, like, what the, what is the premise? What is the premise of this book? Like, and why uh, has Judy Birchall agreed for herself to be depicted in this manner? And, and now it's being, like, held up by, now it's being held up as this amazing thing by members of the chosen, chosen group. I find that, find that really bizarre. Anyway, let's, let's carry on. Here's the back cover. Here's the back cover, okay? They say you never got over your first love, and in my face, in my case, they were right, but typically greedy. My first love was a whole race of people, the Jews. In February 2013, Julie Birchall, the country's most controversial journalist for four decades. Now, is that true? Is it is it true that Julie Birchall is is the country's most is the country's most uh, controversial journalist. Really? Judy Birchall. You know, she's a leftist for one thing. So that's bollocks, isn't it, Julie? Um, like, who who else has become more controversial uh, than Judy Birchall? Like literally anyone. Rod Little, Peter Hitchens, uh, James Dellingpole. Easily more controversial than Julie Birchall. I would suggest. Um, but anyway, let's let's continue. Julie Birchall, the country's most controversial journalist for four decades, became the first person to choose Hatavika, the Israeli national anthem, on BBC Radio 4's Desert Island Discs. Now, for the first time, she tells the full story of her philo-Semitism and how a chance discovery of her father's copy of The World at War magazine issue on the Holocaust changed her life and kindled an obsessive love that still sustains her. Over ten no-holds-barred chapters, the book details the course of this affair, from her days as a rock journalist pretending to be Jewish, to her attempts to learn Hebrew, and eventual exile from her local synagogue for being tr too pro-Israeli. I mean, what the fuck? This is just... <laughs> this is... um. This is really bizarre. Um, <laughs> can anybody explain to me? I mean, Ophir, you're here. You, you are Israeli, right? Explain to me what the hell's going on here. How has this? Ha how has it happened that this Julie Birchall is so in love with another group of people that she's literally pretending to be one of them? Um, and uh, like, why is she being? Why is she being thrown out of a? Why are you being thrown out of a synagogue for being too... This is really, really bizarre. And and not only bizarre, published by a major press. This is, came out with Random House, one of the biggest presses in the world, um, and being openly celebrated by other members of the establishment uh, and herself. There she is, look. Literally a clown. And this is being celebrated. I just find this, find this fascinating. Unchosen is not a book for anyone who wants a balanced account of modern Jewish culture. It's part love letter, part howl of rage at the returning specter of anti-Semitism. By her own admission, this is the subject that matters the most to her, and Unchosen is the most difficult, most important book she's ever written. 15 quid. 55-year-old journalist, Julie Birchall. She's married and lives in Brighton. So, uh, yeah, very interesting indeed. Uh, so, uh, um, she's written other books too. She's written fiction. She's written nonfiction. And then uh, these are the chapters. So um, maybe I think what we'll do is we will do a, we will do a, um, I'll do a quick uh, kind of poll. Uh which chapter should we have a look at first? A short history of philo-Semitism, 
uh, finding out hip young Hebrew gun, gunslinger or meet the perverts? What should we do? People on chapter three, hip young Hebrew gunslinger. I think three has it. Meet the perverts heard once. Uh, people want chapter 14. What's that? There is no chapter 14. Um, I think three has it, to be honest. So let's have a little look at chapter three here. And I will pause to comment um, on this book. Um, you know, uh, so that it's it is truly an act of uh, an act of cultural commentary, and not just reading the book out. Uh, let's see if I can find it a minute. Uh, I, do, I I mean, really, is strange how. And then, very interesting is that she she writes for uh, she writes for Spike as well. So that. Tells you a lot about uh, a lot about Spike and what they are about. Uh, book. Okay, so that's the bit about that chapter in itself looked interesting, didn't it? Unchosen. <sighs> so, chapter three. Hip young Hebrew gunslinger. Be yourself. Write about what you know. From the cradle to the grave, the homespun homilies of honesty are thrust upon one like a jar of pot puree masquerading as a fragrant bouquet, all dusty and redundant, yet hopeful of being passed off as an original and inspiring gift that one should go into a regular swoon upon receiving. Well, I mean... That that mantra there is pure boomer truth. I should I should mention that whole. I mean, they do tell writers to write about what you know because otherwise they tend to write like fan, like fantasy nonsense. Um, so there is some truth to that as a writer, but the uh, the whole be yourself thing is uh, is pure is pure boomer truth. I would I would suggest. Um, anyway, let's. Uh, uh, people want me to. In, make the text bigger that's as big as i can get it all right uh can i get it bigger here there you go how's that how's that friends but yeah pure boom of truth so far but what if you didn't know who you were apart from the self-defiling teen dream you're gonna get it tonight i would often growl at my gorgeous naked self oh by the way uh, we should probably look at Julie Birchill, like what she looks like, so you have a you have an image of her here. Because if I'm correct in thinking, she is she's kind of known for being a bit uh, being a bit frumpy. I think. Let's have a look. This is Julie Birchill, okay? Um, here she is. So you've probably seen her. Like she's a she's usually a She's she's often a rent a gob on you know mainstream media and she she writes for all sorts of people. Um, so so there we go. There, there is Julie Birchill, um, who is so pro Jewish that she has pretended to be. Uh, she's written this book. Okay, so let it, let it, let us let us carry on. Um, <clears throat> find this. Find really, I really do find this a fascinating topic as to how, because to be thrown out of a synagogue for being too pro-Israeli is really, really something. Um, so uh, yes, uh, hopefully you can you can see this. People are saying she's a Joe Brand uh, lookalike. Uh, okay, where are we? Uh, I would often growl at my gorgeous naked self of a morning as I pulled on my vile school uniform, following a wide-eyed pouts and a finger pointing at my shimmering sternum. Who me? I'd pipe up tremendously. Yes, I was weird. 
suffering from a chronic case of inappropriate ethnic identification with the people of whom I'd never even come within a sniffing distance. And how could I, uh, how could you write about what you knew if you didn't know anything uh, that you had to get out of the place that you were condemned to live in? No disrespect to my sainted parents. I read a line in an essay by the great David Ceridis recently about his sister Gretchen, and it really spoke to me, complete with jazz hands. So I find this I find this fascinating because Judy Birchall is somebody who feels like a foreigner in her own country because she wants to be she what she literally feels so culturally Jewish that she wants to become Jewish. And I think there's something in this that we can learn from friends. Um, I think there's something interesting in it. But anyway, let's carry on. She said, it was like having a foreign exchange student living in our house. Nothing we said or did made any sense to her, as she seemed to follow the rules and customs of some exotic, faraway nation. Mm, it's very interesting how this has come, how this has come to pass. Um, the Jews had become a symbol to me of escape, of outsiderness, not just embraced, but made magnificent. Now, when I went to the library, I wasn't looking up sex things in an encyclopedia. I was looking about stuff about Israel. Right from the beginning, I shied away from the shower. I didn't want to know about them being heard. I wanted to understand how they came to be strong. My blind, uncritical love of Israel, which accepted and, ad and indeed accepts to this day, without question, every last thing it does, could be said. I mean, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's hard to know whether this is satire or, or real, right? Is, is this real? But this is like, celebrated in the main this is fuck fucking she is dressed as a clown on the front of the book um it's it, it, anyway let, let, let's just let's just carry on my blind uncritical love of israel which accepted and indeed accepts to this day without question every last thing it does could be seen by an unfriendly type who more than likely has the hots for the opposite team so they can talk as the way a maths obsessor now, now can i just say something there um there is no what opposite team it, this this notion that to be critical of one thing you have to be pro the other thing is not true uh, i don't care about palestine never have done never will do um I, I i mean on that issue which i i don't talk about much on this channel my view has always been like yeah we don't care we just we just shouldn't care either way, um, and uh, that it seems to me is a position that is not allowed in the media. The the media will always frame us as being pro one side or pro the other side, and it, like indifference is not an option in the, in the mainstream. So uh, anyway, let's uh, let let let's let's carry on. Um, so uh, yes, um, the way a maths obsessive delights in ultimate extreme algebra puzzle it wasn't a crush like you'd have a pop star pinup it was something you could look at forever trying to work out but knowing that you wouldn't actually be missing out on any aspect of it uh, if you never had made any headway whatsoever on getting to the root of it because just looking is so wonderful to this day i'm the only person i know whose reaction to any result in an israeli e election is we won whether the first prize scoop was by left, right, and or center. I mean, fucking hell. Just the thought of Jews voting for other Jews strikes me as the most immensely wonderful thing. I'm almost... This is really, really strange. I mean, it, can anybody in the chat tell me that they think this is not... This is not unusual, this book. This is fucking mental. Um, uh, yeah. Um, hold on a minute. You're going to have to give me a second, folks, because I still have this bloody cold. I just have to get some uh, loo roll a, a minute so I uh, don't sniffle all the way through the stream. I mean, one second. You can, you can carry on uh, looking at this uh, book.
All right, sorry, I'm uh, I, sorry there. I'm I'm now back. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing to one thing to mention very very quickly um, about the, about the bizarreness uh, of of this of this book is that um, everybody in the chat saying, "Well, she's mental. She's actually insane." But this woman is not mental or insane, or indeed an ins an outsider in the British establishment. She is. Uh, an influential journalist. She is somebody who writes for the mainstream media. She is somebody, this book hasn't come out with some like fringe, you know, this has come out with one of the most mainstream presses uh, that you can imagine with massive praise from establishment figures on the back of it uh, and all, all over the place. So um, yeah, I, I would, I would suggest that this, this in itself um, then leads me to ask further questions about um, about like how we've arrived at this place where somebody who's clearly mental um, is being valorized by the establishment in the in the way in the way that she is. Okay, she says to this today. Um, yeah, uh, blah blah blah. blah, blah. Uh, it's like Portney. This is Portney's complaint, which is a novel uh, I was uh, made to read at university. It's like Portney says when we when he first visits the country after a lifetime of being around weak and worrying di diaspora types. Look at the Jewish children laughing, acting as if they own the place, which they do. Ah, okay. Um, yes. Um, I never thought. I, I never sought in the Jews what many uh, penny anti fellow Semites seek. Jewish warmth and all that jazz, like poor dumb Mary Jane in Portnoy's complaint, the only Jewish warmth I was ever interested in came out of a circumcised cock, frankly. Fucking hell. Oh, fucking hell. Jesus Christ. Oh, this is what... <laughs> However bad I thought this book was going to be, it's even worse. Like, it's bizarre. It really is. Fucking hell. Oh, Birchill, you are fucking. I don't like Jewish humor, the film of Woody Allen's or Bagels. I don't think families are the most important thing in the world. I'm not seeking anything from the Jews at all, if truth be told. I'm seeking an absence, a mystery, an unknowable something which happened centuries ago, which resulted in a tribe of desert nomads surviving for four millennia, while every sucker, charlatan, and seducee attempted to eradicate them, to basically build the modern world. A tribe which then imagined itself uh, into triumphant rebirth as a nation, combative and contrary as all get out, after ceaseless centuries of roaming in the wilderness. And there is more than one sort of wilderness. Just how did a desert tribe, apparently not that much different from any other bunch of biblical primitives, come out of a bleak, bullied walkabout as what looks to me very much like the next step in the evolution of mankind? <coughs> uh, put simply, the Jews were never given for making the rest of mankind look like monkeys in comparison. <clears throat> These were never forgiven for making the rest of mankind look like monkeys in comparison. And ooh, 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 I so did want to be like them. You know, I'm gonna, I have to pause. Sorry, I, I just have to pause. Um, this is so... Uh, this is bizarre. Now, people saying this video will not be online for long would then have to tell me why is this book published? This, but this book is not. This book is mainstream. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything, <laughs> one way or the other about it, other than pointing out that this exists and this is valorized by the mainstream. This is my point here. Um, I find it profoundly strange that Julie Birch had arrived in this place. Uh, so, there we go. Let's uh, let's carry on. Looking back over what I've written here, there is, of course, an elephant in the room, especially in my bedroom. Apart from that playful pachyderm named masturbation, which, hot as hell, 
and determined to keep myself tidy for what lay ahead. I stole that line from Princess Diana. I became a veritable virtuoso at from the age of 12. Sometimes, oh, for fuck's sake. Sometimes giving myself such a good seeing to that I, that I land on the floor beside my bed with a profoundly childish bump and scurry sneakily back under the covers again as my mum calls up the stairs, Oi, you've got a baby elephant up there. But even more than masturbation, I mean music. Music was the noisiest elephant in the room as I hit adolescence. It's, a, it's interesting that, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that she has a, a, a massive interest in uh, this and now suddenly we get into like rank degeneracy why why is there why why is this paragraph of rank degeneracy nuzzling up to this philosemitism questions must be asked here um and hopefully she's she's about to answer it but even before the masturbation i i mean music music was the noisiest elephant in the room i hit adolescence and the one thing i loved as much as the jews and abusing myself Sometimes gazing at my posters of Mark Bolan, a Jew, nay Feld, some of Simeon. Now, I didn't know that Mark Bolan was Jewish, so that's interesting. Didn't know that. Um, I found it hard to know where music ended and masturbation began. And that was the magic of being a teenager in a naughty old nutshell. When you're a kid, a teenager, music is like a dream of sex. It's like, I mean, I was really into music as a kid. Um, and still am into music, and it's never been about masturbation for me, love. So, I mean, ha press one if you think uh, music and masturbation need to go together, and press two uh, if you think music can just live on its own without the masturbation. But let's just see how many people agree with old Judy here. This is fucking mental, this book. Yes, I don't see a single one. Everybody says two. So, you're weird, Julie. Oh, there is a one. Mutty meme. I see you, Mutty meme. I see you. You should write to Julie. You should write to uh, Julie Birchall. Um, when you're a kid, a teenager, music is like a dream. A dream of sex. It's like, as my husband Dan says, standing on a really high rooftop for the first time and looking out and seeing all manner of fast fantastic things you've never ever dreamed existed and if the music is good enough if it touches you hard enough in all the soft places it makes you feel that you can fly i started adoring mark bolan at the age of 12 later when i was a sassy 17 year old he would catch my eye in a punk club and smile and i would look away quickly as if he could uh, as if he could have just told uh so i mean as if he could have told just by looking at me all the time as a child, I came so hard thinking about him. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. This is just, um, sorry. Spurned by his erstwhile love slave. And to be honest, by the self-consciously cool crowd in general, who probably all masturbated over his image as kids. He mooched around the club alone for a little longer and then left alone, just like in How Soon Is Now. And soon he died a rock star's death, wrapped around a tree in a speeding car. Ah, the fickleness of self-fiddling youth. Now, just to, just to explain what's happening in the literary, in the literary mode here, um, Judy Birchall has done something that she thinks is clever because... She mentioned Portnoy from Portnoy's Complaint. And if you've ever read Portnoy's Complaint, it is a, a novel by a Jewish guy all about masturbating as a teenager and about the as about his kind of furious masturbation um, when he was an adolescent. Um, and now uh, Birchill has basically is doing her own version of Portnoy's Complaint only as a woman. Do you see? So there is a bit of like... You could say, well, this is all filth, but it's also kind of like self-consciously literary in a way that may make 
um, you know, uh, sophisticated London types titter to themselves uh, for knowing that, for knowing that. It's not clever, by the way. It's not, there's not, nothing about that makes it clever. It just says that you've read Portnoy's complaint and so have we. I mean, it just means nothing. So I have, um, I, I, I have nothing but, uh, Nothing but contempt for this passage, but uh, anyway, let, let 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 us let us carry on to see where this goes, and um, if we get to the end of the chapter, maybe we'll we'll do a different we'll do another one. Um, but in the early seventies, from Ride a White Swan in nineteen seventy one to Twentieth Century Boy in nineteen seventy three, um, Mark Boland's a singer from T Rex. If you if you don't know, uh, there is nothing I wouldn't have done. Uh, let me just put the entropy chat in there. I keep on forgetting to do that. Uh, people did ask earlier. There you go. Entropy chat is now pinned. Um, I can see DOA is in the house. Hope you're enjoying Julie Birchall's, uh, Julie Birchall's memoirs here about her philosemitism, which has turned into a chronicle of her masturbating as a, as a, as a teenager. Anyway, she says, but in the early 70s, from Rider White Swan in 1971 to 20th Century Boy in 1973, there is nothing I wouldn't have done for this doe-eyed, sucky-cheeked, glitter-dusted man-boy. I mean anything. The things I thought up for us to do, should should we ever have the good fortune to be locked in the lavatory together from Monday to Saturday, just like in the nursery rhyme, make my blood run cold, even now to countenance. And I've been married three times. It's a wonder it wasn't four times, as I distinctly recall after reading one of Dennis Wheatley too many times, drawing a risibly inept pentagram on a bit of school graph paper one night when my parents were innocently imbibing at the local hostelry the good intent and solemnly promising my soul to Beelzebub if he fixed it for me to marry Mark B when I came of age. Just think, if I'd smiled back that that night at the vortex, I could be one of your actual damned by now. And I don't mean the rubbish punk group either. Anyway, during these couple of years, I would buy anything with his face on. That included a horrible, boring looking newspaper type thing called the New Musical Express with no color photos. You could probably touch yourself up over and dirty black ink that came off on one pinkies anyway. The idea of getting ink on one's clitoris was appalling to me at the age of 12. Later, it would seem not so bad at all. Fuck's sake. Fucking hell. I was... <laughs> I mean, this is... I, I just want to... I want to explain again, okay, as I blow my nose... This is not some niche book. This is not a book that is was somehow kind of buried away on the fetish aisle or on the kind of extreme literature end of things. This was valorized, published by Random House, championed and put front and center in our culture, this book. This book where the, 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 the author pictures herself as a clown on the front, surrounded by Jewish people, talks about how she wishes she was Jewish, and then writes a chapter about how she furiously masturbated uh, over the face of a of a Jew when she was uh, when she was young. Um, you know, this is pretty close to what passes for our mainstream culture today. And questions have to be asked: as why, why is this book so front and center? And should that be the case? <laughs> should this should this book have been as relentlessly promoted as it was in two thousand and fourteen? Um, anyway, let's continue. I was beyond delighted to find a three-part interview with him by someone called Nick Logan, which contained swearing, swearing, and one's masturbatory idol doesn't get any better. I wondered as I abused myself for the nth time. A word about the enemy here. It was selling more than 300 copies a week back then and had the unmistakable rough beast swagger of a magazine whose time has come. Now it sells less than 24,000 and looks like some free sheet that you'd see left undefiled on the bus 
But in 1972, somehow, for reasons, it felt itself and did not uh, seem to understand. It had been around since 1952, and quite recently was wetting its collective uh, nicks at the sight of Helen Shapiro sharing a joke with Joe Loss. It had become a sort of world service of hip, and should remain so until the 1980s, when the new glossies prized the baton of the zeitgeist from its pale, pale, clammy hand. Can I just say, uh, by the way, that um, I I despise this <coughs> as the author of Foundations of Writing, and as someone who really cares about the craft of writing. It's very clear to me that Judy Birchill comes from this world of music journalism. Music journalism is the epicenter of bad writing. Um, I hate her style. I hate this kind of, there's something about this piling up of shitty adjectives and uh, just, just her whole manner of writing um, is horrible to me. So, if, you know, if you do foundations of writing and come out writing like this, um, I'll give you a refund. I'll tell you that much. Um, decades later, I met a boy from New Zealand, pleasingly, pleasingly <laughs> named David Cohen. And he expressed the way most enemy readers who live beyond the exciting burgs of London and New York felt. Can you imagine being 15 and just sitting on this rock at the end of the world? And then every week this paper arrives and you actually feel part of the world for once. Happily, David C. got back in touch with me through the wonder of Facebook while I was writing this. And I asked him to elaborate further. He said the following, the last bit of which is a testimony to my extreme Zionism, even in my SWP late teens. The boy looked at Johnny having been published in 1978. Regarding the enemy, it's hard to overstate what a cultural staple this was for younger New Zealanders in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, I remember the enemy when I was a kid. Uh, it was... Um, the enemy were... When I was a teenager in the in the 90s, they were trying to reorientate themselves as a kind of Brit pop outfit. But... Um, I always thought Enemy had kind of like it was already past its time when I was a teenager and you could tell that it wasn't really where it was at, uh, in my opinion. Um, but it had this it had this reputation as being once a bastion of cool when I was a teenager. So uh maybe it's maybe its high point was the early eighties there or or the seventies, uh when Julie was around. Um anyway, uh uh, she says, um, it's hard to overstate what a cultural staple this was for younger New Zealanders in the 1970s and 80s. It was very expensive in those days, so any British publication typically took upon uh, up to four months to arrive in the Antipodes. And of course, given how quickly new trends were being discovered and then ditched by the paper's writers, it often happened uh, that the smart set who read it would be latching on to acts who had been long consigned to the rubbish bin back in the UK. So <laughs> the cultural lag was like four or five months behind in uh, New Zealand. So you had this kind of long echo thing going on in the Antipodes. In, for example, the cases of Joy Division, the Specials, the Smiths, and all the rest. But that didn't uh, stop almost everyone else here lapping it up. And of course, in the case of young rock crit crits, Completely aping the style. Yeah, I mean, the enemy style is cancer. I'll just, I'll just put it out there. The style of enemy criticism is cancer. And it should be a blitter. I mean, I cannot wait for this generation of writers, the Julie Birchalls and this fucking Den David Cohen or whoever. I cannot wait for them to go. Uh, but unfortunately, they've passed it on. They've passed on that style to the pitchfork types which also has a cancerous, I hate that style. And uh, I mean, what do they teach in journalism school? What, what do they even teach these, these, these people? Um, oh, hold on. Oh, 
What I mean, what what is enemy style like? You know. They are that I mean they they love they love sentences like um you know uh oh uh, great new album it's like Bob Dylan meets Leonard Cohen uh, I mean what what the fuck does that sentence mean you know uh, you see that all the time you see that sort of thing all the time and it's like just fuck off um you know uh uh is it <sighs> yes uh, let's carry on um. I was a terrible offender in this respect, so much so that I can't bear to look at anything I wrote back about music in my late teens and early 20s because it was so horribly derivative of the same. What do you want about Julie? You still write in the same way now. Nonetheless, the culture here would have been much different here without it. I remember really enjoying your writing, in particular because the voice was just, oh yes, sorry, this is Nick Cohen saying that, not Julie, that's right. Um, I remember really enjoying your writing in particular because the voice was so distinctive, no, derivate, uh, no derivation there. And for the fact that it was a woman working in such an overwhelmingly testosterone-soaked organ. But to be totally honest, what got me the most was line four of the dedications in The Boy Looked at Johnny, which, as a somewhat alienated 17-year-old, I thought was just stunning, and all the more for the publishers disassociating themselves from it. That took courage. And I think, I hope, in some way, it inspired me much more than any of those dear dead reviews from Enemy in my later work. Line four of the dedication in The Boy Looked at Johnny was uh, to no less than Menachem Begin, the great Israeli prime minister, whose Ergun liberation movement was the most militant in its actions against British rule in Palestine, a name for Judea. I was to discover, imposed by the Roman conquerors. The co-author, Tony Parsons, and I found it amazing and amusing in equal parts as to how the Jewish-owned left-wing Pluto Press could actually go so far as dissociating themselves from the, a dedication, which was sure by its nature so personal that such an action was superfluous, to say the least. What's, what's this uh, boy calls Johnny? Is this uh, some... The boy called John. Is this a some book by Julie Birchall? Boy called John. What, what is this book that she she they're going about? Um, we should probably find out. What's what's, what's, what's this book called? Uh, boy looked at Johnny. Let's have a look. Is this a Julie Birchall novel? Oh, that would make sense. Uh, boy looked at Johnny. The Obituary of Rock and Roll by Julie Birchall, published in 1970, 79, sorry, 1987. The boy looked at Johnny. Here we go. Um, yeah, let me let me just share this uh, so you know what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> this is The Boy Looked at Johnny. You can see it's associated with like... Sex Pistols. We looked at uh, Johnny Rotten uh, earlier, earlier in an earlier deeper story, if you recall. Um, so there we are. The boy looked at Johnny. The obituary of rock and roll by Julie Birchill and Tony Parsons. Um, Tony Parsons. He was another of these kind of rock, rock dudes. There he is. He Tony Parsons is often also a kind of. Um, talking head on on many kind of mainstream mainstream media documentaries and things like that um so yes uh then we'll, we'll get back then to um virtual's book uh only being young brats of the working class blood royal this probably wasn't the way we expressed our contemptuous incredulity to each other at the time prats was probably nearer our considered opinion, certainly no further from the truth. Interestingly, the other quarter from which the most objection came to our dear little dedication was from a fellow working class music hack, Gary Bushell of Sounds. Now, Gary Bushell is also a rent -a gob who you'll find, um, I think he wrote for The Sun for many years. Let me just show you a picture of Gary Bushell. He's a kind of squashed-faced kind of 
vermin of a man as well. I really hate these people. I really do. Uh, but yeah, here is Gary Bushell, who is often also uh, on the same sorts of shows that you find Tony Parsons and Judy Birchall on. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's carry on. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the other objection came from Gary Bushell of Sound. Even writing that last bit of the sentence makes me wince. And I'm not exactly sensitive. It's just so horrid. You know, you grow up reading Dottie Parker and Ozzy Wilde, and you never dream that one day you're going to be using exactly the same exquisite tongue in which to grimly etch the words Gary Bushel of sounds. Old Bacon Bonce with his grotty wife fronts, one imagines with a shudder, into a right old twist over it, banging on about Zionist war criminals and what have you. Bushel is most remembered these days for, cultiv for cultivating the oi bands, a gaggle of outfits which arrived as the afterbirth of punk, so very unsophisticated that they even made Sham 69 look like the Dave Brubach Quartet, which eventually brought forth luscious fruit in the blessed year of 1981 in the form of Strength Through Oi, compilation album under the auspices of Bacon Bonds himself. <clears throat> this is one of the things that the enemy style was known for, by the way, this endless fucking run on sentence, you know, the, 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 the bunching up of adjectives behind a noun that never fucking. Sorry, uh, sorry, people. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Uh, I, I was, I, no, no, no. I was gesticulating wildly as I was talking, and I just happened to um, uh, hit my microphone, and it caused it to come un, undone. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Y you can hear me. Okay. Um, so let me let me just read that last bit again. Anyway, back to the past and the past glories of the enemy in particular. Long after Mark Bolan had fallen out of favor with my childish fist, fucking disgusting, I continued to cleave to my enemy as fiercely as a suicidal baby to a poison rattle. And um, as I was uh, ranting into the mic um, while it was muted, uh, I was saying there is no excuse to write like that is a dis that is a disgusting sentence. Every part of that sentence is disgusting. The childish fist part is disgusting. The um, the suicidal baby image is disgusting, and the poison rattle is disgusting. There's, there's just no excuse for that sentence. So, um, yes, uh, I, I really find that, I really find that gross. Uh, really find it gross. Um, yeah, I, I don't know when exactly my, uh, I don't know when exactly my mic cut out. I was in the middle of a rant about. Um, sentences that uh you know adjectives that pile up without a noun finally arriving and i think uh, as i gesticulated saying that uh, it knocked my mic um so um so 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 there we go but th th this is just a disgusting way of writing it really is all around me the glowing normality of my friends and family showed me how happy and straightforward life could be but i mean you got the fucking option of living with normality around you, Judy, before you decided to destroy the culture all around us, so that now any normal person is surrounded by Judy Birchalls. That you know, now 
a 13 year old in a school now will be surrounded by Judy Birchalls and they all made to be feel they all made to be feel abnormal because they're not like you. That's what's happened. You are responsible, Julie. Uh, anyway, let's carry on. Uh, she says, um, uh, <clears throat> if only one expected small pleasures, and I wanted none of it. If I'd had to put into words, I would have said in my yokelish tilt that I wanted to be a poetry writing junkie dying of consumption in an attic. Thank you very much. And could I please be a lesbian too while you're at it, Santa? <clears throat> So she doesn't just want to be Jewish. She wants to be a lesbian and a junkie uh, dying in an attic as well. Uh, the enemy writers, well, Charles, Shaw, Murray, and Nick Kent, anyway, made my school girlish head swim with the lush, loosh lives that they appeared to lead. Years later, I discovered CSM to be a hen-pecked husband straight out of a sitcom, and Nick Kent to be so half-witted that on regularly bumping into a hat stand on entering the enemy office, he apologized to it. But anyway, and they didn't even have to play and they and they didn't even have to play a sodding musical instrument in order to get these lives. I knew from various besotted English teachers that I had a way with words. Might I somehow use those words to get away? I wish those fucking English teachers had taught you how to write, Julie. That's my that's my honest opinion as somebody who has taught English at the highest level, I would uh, I would recommend uh, you to go back and learn how to write again because, honestly, this book is making me angry for its prose style alone. I was also querying another matter at this time. Could one actually make oneself a lesbian by having the hots for oneself too frequently? I was once a regular little girl kissing boys behind the school library shelves, never anything as sordid as bike sheds, forever bookish little me and masturbating over caterwauling love totems but I seem increasingly interested in girls as I edge through my teens I had an inkling that it might have been sheer self-preservation as I became of an age where I might conceivably I might conceivably conceive and thus up the ante of getting struck in nowheresville on southern forever I shied away from the source of such semen spread shackledom. So, so she sees the prospect of family life as being ultimately constraining. She doesn't want that. So, so just to explain this in normal lay English, Julie Birchall so feared having a family that she was trying to will herself to become a lesbian, to get away from it. Or is it simply that I fancied myself so often in my full-length junior princess dressing table mirror of a morning that I had gone and turned myself irretrievably queer? All that masturbation, and it had been a girl's hand doing it. Fucking hell. Whoo. Spiteful mutant, I mean, this is, uh, this is something. Really is something. When my mother made coy comments about boys i wanted to strike her maybe this lesbohood was my punishment for upsetting her whenever she attempted to give me a goodnight kiss father has it ever occurred to you that mother may have lesbian tendencies i would pipe pompously pushing her away when i thought of the it's, it's kind of interesting that it's this it's this woman who kind of wants to be jewish um uh, find it really odd uh, when i thought of the ark animals going in two by two, it made me want to wretch. What if they had absolutely nothing in common? The unutterable vulgarity of the whole set up made me wince. Anyway, like a million other pale teenage self-abusers, I saw that photo of Patti Smith from the cover of Horses album, and I was barely able to sit down for a week. Oh, for fuck's sake. Do you want to know what uh, Judy was masturbating over? Let's have a look at Patty Smith's horses again, uh, so that you too, you too can pretend. You know, if you're a female in my audience, uh, you too can try to will yourself to become a lesbian. Talk about ashes of civilization. It's a great album, by the way. It's a really good album. But there you go. 
this is what Judy Birchall is talking about there. So, uh, yeah, let's carry on. Tell you what, this is it, whatever I thought this was going to be. It's blown. It's blown even my expectations of it. This uh, this book so far, like another million pale uh, teenage self abusers. I saw that photo of Patty Smith from the cover of Horses, and I could barely sit down for a week. I buy it. Don't get it, but I love it anyway. Smith would turn out to be your archetypal, beautiful but dumb showbiz kid, saying things like, there's a real lot of inspiration going on between the murder and his victim, and slagging off Israel like a thing possessed. But but for now, that's her real crime. Her real crime was slagging off Israel, of course. Um, but for now, my bed was on fire five times a night, and not just because of the drought, sticky with ambition and lust. I tossed and turned in my vaginal bed all night long, but especially tossed. In, in the long, hot summer of July 1976, they prayed for rain in the churches of the West Country. So did I. A flood, something, anything to sweep me clean away from this lovely place and my wonderful parents into a fetid embrace of unkind strangers. In Uganda, at the Entebbe airport, Palestinian and German hijackers of all the countries of the world and, of the t and all of the terrorists of the world, Palestinians had to hook up with Germans to kill Jews, separated Jewish and non-Jewish passengers on the Air France airplane. They have been hijacked as they chose who will die first. Was it back or did it really never end? I completed my O-levels and agreed to go back and do my A-levels. And That paragraph there just kind of whacked in. Apropos of nothing, uh, I completed my O levels and agreed to go back and do my A levels in September. Anything would be better than admit getting a job in the sodding biscuit factory and admitting defeat. She could have, she could have, she was living in Trumpton and she could have gone and worked at the biscuit factory, but instead she's doing this fucking degeneracy. I read that piece by the man who passed for Jewish in Rolling Stone magazine, pale with envy. I also turned 17. WTF, I lay on the grass in, in the back garden, sulking about how my life was over before it had begun, until a bunch of bastards who were obviously in league with my mother, made me jump up from my unwholesome idling, and headed straight into the house to have another quick abuse of myself over the sleeve of horses, <laughs> as luck would have, have it, after checking that the parents were otherwise employed. Now that I was 17, masturbation felt sad, whereas it had been the most fun I'd ever have. Once it had made me feel free, but now it made me feel like a dirty jailer. If I met you, I could get away from here, I told the impassive woman whose image I had propped up on the pillow. I know I could get away if I met you and never come back. Then a miracle happened in black and white for two weeks in July Innobly jostled by the ads for no time wasters and tie dye shirt wasters and ad runs in the enemy. Attention, hip young gunslingers! The enemy has a vacancy for a staff writer. Pre previous experience in either journalism or music business is not essential, where a good knowledge of rock and enthusiasm are, together with the ability to write lovely, incisive prose. All applications must be accompanied by a sample 500 to 600 word review of any album of the applicant's choice. So here we go. Here, here's Judy's big chance to make it into the world of hip degeneracy. Does she make it? <laughs> Let's see, readers. I can do that, I thought. I had a typewriter. How's your typing coming on? My mum was wont to ask, poking her head round the door of the back room where I furiously pounded out fantasies of sex and revenge. I'm writing, mum, not typing, I hissed for the nth time, but I decided that I was going to milk my youth for all it was worth. I hand-wrote my horse's review on paper torn jaggedly from a school book. I shook my fountain pen over the finished effort for that extra inky-fingered teenage scamp effect. I was stage-managing myself even then, even when the nearest I'd been to his stage was my star turn as the sailor doll in the mixed juniors panto way back before I grew tits and ambition. 
there were more than 15,000 applicants for that job, of which, of course, I didn't know at the time. But even if I had known there had been a million, I would still have been sure of getting it. I laughed at my mum's mates who could feel things in their water. But from the moment I posted that envelope to the new Musical Express, King's Reach Tower, Stamford Street, London, SE1, into the post box at the top of my street, it was my street no longer. I became like an astronaut in one of those sleeping chambers, frozen, waiting for life to begin. To all intents and purposes, I seemed the same. I cheeked my mum. I swore at the dog. I abused myself. But really, I was in a trance state, treading water and biding my time. Solemnity. Hold on a minute. Solemnly contemplating the helter-skelter I had been wanting to throw myself down, hedge first, ever since I heard the word London. Three, Of course she has to end up in London. Of course she does. Three weeks into my A-levels in September, I got the job. Oh, shit. I, I got the job. I remember, pretending Jewish man, could I become my, um, my own Frankenstein and his creation too? Yes, I could. I dyed my hair black. I shivered with pleasure at my own reflection. I abused myself extra that night. Nothing could stop me. I was about to abandon speech, that chunky, clunky second language. I had to, I had come to low and embrace my mother tongue, writing, and better yet, I would do it as a Jew. For me, at least, the drought was over. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. For someone as obsessed with honesty, I, I'm just putting that in because I'm imagining that's what she was. She, she, the, the prose was building up to a climax as she masturbated to horses, you see, and that's why I, I imagine that that was about to come in. Uh, so uh, there we have it. Um, f for somebody, uh, for someone as obsessed with honesty as I have become, it never fails to shock me that I went into my job at the enemy living not just one lie, but two. For starters, I said I love punk music. Ha, I was a punk of convenience from the start, realizing instinctively that they were looking for some hot young blood to wet nurse them, as it were, through the upcoming and somewhat problematic to a bunch of wet middle-class hippies, that is, punk movement. The only music that existed for me was black music, and punk was just about the whitest, most sexless, sexless and joyous sound I'd ever heard. But I threw away my dancing shoes and grabbed the safety pins PDQ, and thus began my short career as a hypocrite. But when you're a super bright working class girl who knows that following one's mater into a covered box factory is definitely not quite uh, what one is dreaming of, you don't have the luxury of taking decisions at leisure. Unlike the dreary, late-blooming offspring of the middle class, you don't faff away your fruit salad chew days pissing around the u with uni and gap years and sabbaticals until your mid-twenties. You see a ladder climbing down from the copter, and you climb. It's a pity they didn't fuck you throw you off the helicopter, I tell you. I remember many a night coming home to my scuzzy bedsit in my dear how divinely amusing, crouch end, my ears ringing with the latest vile white trash cacophony, peeling off my dumbass punk gear and dancing round the room in my scanties to the cleansing balm of the Isley Brothers Forever Gold on my little red dancette. Free at last of that rotten white racket. Free at last. Fortunately, punk would be over within two years. The only thing good about it, in my opinion. Even more deviously, I have presented myself as a Jew, getting around my yokel, piping, and resolutely rural place surname by claiming that my mother was a Polish Jewish called Elizabetha Griespan. I'm actually cringing as I write this for the first time. During my library forays into Jewish history, I had been very taken with a photograph of a 17-year-old Hirschel Grinspan. He was a beautiful young refugee from Poland who in the striking black and white photographs of him at the time of his notoriety could have been mistaken for a neurotic boy outsider of the crooning or modelling mode. 
but was in fact famous for the rather more substantial achievement of assassinating the German diplomat Ernst von Rath on the 9th of November 1938 in Paris, providing the Nazis with a pretext for Kristallnacht, the pogrom of the 10th and 11th of November, which saw Jewish homes, synagogues, shops and businesses destroyed across Germany. In 1944, Sir Michael Tippett's on uh, Otario about him, a child of our time, would first be performed. And 32 years later, I would tell any of my enemy colleagues who asked uh, that he was my mother's cousin. They say <laughs> they say uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that was certainly true in my case. It makes me laugh to look back at it now. True, I dyed my hair black and had a big nose, but with my Somerset twang, I was a very strange Jew indeed. All I lacked was a bit of straw sticking out of my mouth and the perfume of muck spreading on my mitts. So far as I could make out, there were two real Jews at the enemy. And though neither of them had Jewish names, Murray and Farron, I knew by now that incredibly many Jews were uncomfortable with the bounteous blessing of their ethnicity. Still, I was amazed that they didn't rumble me. They apparently were so alienated from their own roots, I tutted, tutted to myself that they had no Judah whatsoever. I remember thinking shocked, boy, Jews can be dumb too. It's weird when you f meet your first dumb Jew, like meeting a gay man who da can't dance. I've never gotten used to it right to this day. I mean, isn't there something really remarkable about this passage here where she she's... She says, how can Jewish people be so alienated from their own roots? Alienated from their own roots. The irony. Do you think she's aware of the irony? Is it possible that she's not aware of the ir irony? Is it possible that she's aware of the irony? So let's carry on. Oh, that's it. Should I, should I do any more? I mean, that was fascinating, wasn't it? That was absolutely fascinating. Let's now look at the front cover again. Um, I, I just find this book remarkable. I really do. My coffee's gone cold. I can either just finish the stream and do Super Chats now, or we could do a bit more. There's, there's Julie, look. Clown. This is a remarkable book. I'm kind of into it, though, you know. I kind of want to read more. It's, it's, it's made me want to read more about this fucking filthy woman. <laughs> um, here's all her other books, look. She wrote a book on Beckham. Yes. I mean, she is truly a subversive, this woman. Truly a cultural subversive. Uh, shall we do one more? Meet the perverts off my face in the promised land. The new Jews. Too cool for sh school. Unchosen. People are saying it's hate porn. Um, no, nah, let's 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 figure out. Somebody's saying read page eighty-eight. <laughs> um, um, let's see where this goes. Shall we just have a look at the the end of the book and have a look at the the concluding paragraph to see what her. I mean, this is remarkable. Because you kind of get an insider look at the look at this and try to understand the not just the psychology of this woman, but like bits of the uh, bits of this. Um, yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I might come back to this, but I might do another stream on this. Because uh, I just find it so fascinating. Um, I bet there's I bet there's a lot worse material in this book that uh, didn't look up.
Let me see if I can get to the end. Ah, I can't bother to anymore. Let's just have a look at entropy and get out of here. So, um, here's the eunuch says, deepest law on the Fallout games could be amazing. I volunteer to be your co-host for that mini-series. I know a lot and can prepare a lovely section on the art sources, etc. that inspire the setting. Um, unfortunately, I only ever played New Vegas. I played a little bit of a Fallout 3, I seem to recall, and Fallout 2, which was the like the isometric one. Um, but um, yeah, uh, here's the eunuch says, so Birchill is like Rachel D Dolziol, but identifies as rich and powerful instead of African. Yes, but interestingly, interestingly, if you notice, she was anti-white in her music tastes. She saw punk as being white, uh, had to pretend to like it and secretly like black music instead. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's part of LARPing as being Jewish or, or, or not, but uh, that's her own words, not mine. Um, uh, King Cribble says, a deepest law on football when? I would especially be interested in Arsenal. I find the metaphysics of Arsenal Wenger at the club reminiscent of Chairman Mario for China, especially given that Mikel Arteta, the latest manager, has a tall image of him emblazoned on the main training ground wall. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I see Arsene Wenger as a kind of uh, leftist in football terms too, but not for the not for the kind of hero worship of him around Arsenal, which is understandable, but more for his um, the fact that he's an ideologue for a certain vision of the game. He's like, like the, the game must be played one way and one way only. Um, and I disagree with that. I'm I'm much more into the pragmatics of the uh, you know Giovanni Trapattoni or Capello or uh, Mourinho or any any other proper proper football manager. Um, so I, I do see Wenger as a kind of a zealous and a kind of ideologue. Um, so uh, yes, um, here's the eunuch says this woman's writing is exactly the kind of putrid filth I'd expect from an agent of Moloch. I mean she she was. She basically said, "I, I, lo I loved masturbating over Mark Boland's face so much. I pray to Satan and Beelzebub." She, like that, that was her own words. Um, absolutely vile. This woman is peak subversive, an anti-white devil of the highest order. Yeah, and I think she'd be proud of that. I think she. I. I don't think that she would um, shy away from saying that she. That 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 is who she is, and um, and she, you know, she embraces it. She embraces the demon within, if you want. Coca-Cola says, so she's female, but not J, and wants to be a J. She must be the bizarro Weininger. Yeah, she's almost like the, she's almost like the, ex if Otto Weininger could make like a reverse negative mirror image of himself, it would come out with Judy Birchall. Uh, Otto Weininger, of course, hated both uh, women and uh, this group, despite being, um, despite being a Jewish himself. So, uh, yes, uh, let me have a look at, uh, super chats. Uh, yeah, she would absolutely be proud of it. I, I have no doubt of that whatsoever. This has been an interesting stream. I think very interesting, Re more revealing, uh, than anything else. I think, um, uh, let's see what else. Um, Cringe Walker says, I hope D is making sound bites about your blind, undying love of Israel. Uh, Cringe Walker, I mean, I am technically a Zionist, uh, incidentally, Cringe Walker, um, in so much as I believe it's important for everybody to have their own homeland. And, um, you know, I think it's like right that they should have their own homelands and go to it. Cringe Walker says, warmth. Uh, and then a little little winky face. Death by Cognitive Dissonance says, I just want to put Julie Birchill into a soundproof room with Years of the Eunuch, lock the door until Years is finished. Um, and Death by Cognitive Dissonance says, reading this has worsened your conditioning. Eh? Yeah, you can say that again. So I've, I felt myself getting iller and iller uh, reading this absolute filth. Um, uh, and that's it. Uh, so... Uh, Hopefully everybody enjoyed this um, first edition of uh, Deepest Law on the on the Monday. Uh, it's uh, it's a new home for Deepest Law. Uh, I can't see the chat now. You need to find it again. Um, 
but uh yes uh we'll be we'll be back uh next week uh Un unpopper opinions is back tomorrow night uh 9 p.m and then cigar stream is 9 p.m or wednesday night this is the new schedule and uh if i can if i can get my nose unblocked for long enough i might make a new channel intro with a new schedule on it i just don't want to make it while i've got this cold because it will sound because it will be there forever and be the first thing anybody lands on so i need to get my voice sorted before i do that all right bye everyone now get out